Sleepy. Don't be so enthusiastic, Sleepy. Tom. <laughs> well, less than a minute into the fucking I'm, shit. I'm getting over all this sickness. <laughs> getting over the sickness. I was feeling pretty good today. My nose isn't fucking with me like it was. Tomorrow I'll probably be, feel real good. But um, I don't know. I just I felt good up until about an hour ago, and all of a sudden I'm getting fucking sleepy. <laughs> But I got I got booze here. I'm you didn't gonna, you didn't take your old man a, that? No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm gonna drink my way out of this shit. <laughs> that seems like a capital idea. Yes, it does. Damn, this topic Pookie sounds was in interesting. Here a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah. Little Pookie came in. She was trying to get in the closet. Is I think she thinks that the closet leads to outside. Yeah. Or so. another house. Or another house. She's yeah. like, maybe there's another house on the other side of this. It's more interesting than this one. She thought the dishwasher went to another house. Remember that? Beijing did, too. Beijing did, too. Yeah, opened it up. She's like, where's that going? <gasps> wow. <laughs> it's like Kitty Narnia. Yeah. Actually, Beijing got really mad at me one time because I wouldn't let her. Night. Well, who's that? Finally. Look, I finally <laughs> you got, got one now. <laughs> finally got a notification. Oh, oh my God. Assholes. Yeah. Beijing got mad at me once because I wouldn't let her get into the dishwasher. She was very upset. Because yeah. I had a, I was loading it or unloading it, and she was, like, trying to jump in. And I'm like, hey, can you not? And she's just like, Put I want to go into the other dimension. Put my hat on. Fingers crossed for no dropouts. Yeah. We've actually, um, we haven't had any problems since last Saturday. Like, we've streamed a lot since then, and everything yeah, seems fine. So it we'll see problem. how it goes. I, I mean, don't count. jinx it. Some kind of that was some kind of maintenance, I think. Yeah, I think that might have been something to do with our Wi-Fi. I think they maybe yeah. were working on it in our area or something like that. But yeah. um, today's show can be about Carl Jung, and uh, yeah, Carl we've, Jung. We've been wanting to do this show for a while. Yeah, <laughs> Carl Jung talked a lot about uh, paranormal and kind of like psychic stuff. All right, and he he wasn't um, a quack. He had some. He had some pretty good theories, and it kind of matches up with what I saw in Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist. And he talks about things like poltergeist phenomena. He, he'd he seen it. Well, he'd yeah, seen, and he said pretty it. much yeah. the same thing about it that you said, that right. he thought that it was an exteriorization. I think he even yeah. used that exact word um, of people's mental turmoil. He tried to show it to Freud. Freud knocking and stuff, Freud didn't want to accept it. Yeah. Evidently. We'll get into that in a little bit, yeah. too, because there's kind of, um, I don't know, I just, Carl Jung is, like, such a fascinating person, because <coughs> it seems like, like I said, you know, he's mainly, you know, the founder of, I guess, analytical psychiatry, analytical psychology, whatever, um, you know, and the whole thing with him and Freud, like, they're, a lot of their ideas were similar, but they had, like, some pretty fundamental differences as well, but I feel like Carl Jung, later on, kind of went off in a more like mystical direction a little yeah. bit, but there was still some basis in, I don't know. He was just like a fascinating combination of scientific rationality and like mysticism. Well, he believed in the unconscious and, and the yeah. unconscious had a lot of paranormal and mystical kind of qualities to it. He had, he, he made this book while he was alive. It, it never, it didn't get published in 2009, I think. Until 2009, yeah. 2009. It's called The Red Book. And it was just some, it was just some kind of legendary, you know, mystical book. It was kind of like an ayahuasca trip or something. He was drawing it, had all these drawings and stuff. He and, worked on it for a long yeah. time. Like 16 years, I think he was like adding shit in there. Yeah, and evidently he said that uh, that the book was kind of dangerous, that if you read it, got into it too much, it would it would start, it would cause paranormal phenomena. That's what he said. But you can get it now. Yeah, they finally did publish it yeah. in 2009. Well, as I said, I was just telling you earlier that, I mean, obviously people knew that the Red Book existed like before then because... You know, Carl Jung died in the 60s and, like, he had been working on it prior to that. But it had kind of been around 
he just he'd been working on it off and on it was he never really um specified whether he wanted the shit published or not um you know to his relatives when he mm -hmm. died he did leave a lot of unpublished stuff but he usually would say hey you know i want this published or that not published but that one he didn't really say anything about it so his kids and then subsequently his grandkids were kind of like we don't know what to do with this so for a while they just kind of left it in the drawer because they didn't know what to do with it and then after then they would have like debates over whether it should be published or not they said all these you know youngians kept coming to us that are like because the red book it had like this you know reputation and everybody wanted to see it so they were kind of like well i don't think we should and all this other stuff so it's like they didn't want their you know they didn't want carl young to be perceived as like a crazy person because some of the stuff in there because like i said it's almost like I want to say it's almost like a spirit walk or something like that because he spent a lot of time, you know, going inside himself and coming up with all these imaginings and stuff. I don't know if he used any psychedelics or anything like that. I don't, not that I know of, but he was doing something similar to that where he was trying to con confront his inner demons and just kind of, so he was just like writing down or painting whatever imagery came to him um, in hopes of gaining some insight. So some of the stuff in there sounds like a crazy person wrote it. And that's, I think that's kind of what his family were worried about. They didn't want anyone perceiving him as, <coughs> you know, having mental problems or anything like that. But finally they did consent to having it published. So as far as I know, I've seen like some internal pages of it and everything like that. But I guess in 2009, they finally succeeded in you know, they, they flew it in like this little, I read there was a really long article in uh, the New York Times from 2009. And um, I read the whole thing and it was really interesting about um, the guy that translated it. And um, he was the one that was taking it. They said they had like a special little briefcase with all this padding in it and stuff. And they had to take it to this place. And I think it was in California somewhere, like this high end digital media studio and they had to like take pictures of each page like in super high resolution and all this other kind of because it's almost it's like an illustrated manuscript it's like really really cool looking so you know so so it's out there now um and as i said i don't feel like the reason that i find him such a fascinating character is because he was obviously a scientist and he had that mindset but he also had that he also had that kind of thing where just this, he was just fascinated by mysticism and occultism and, um, you know, his whole theory of like collective unconscious, like we all have these, like this kind of myth pool that we all draw from, like all these symbols and everything that are, you know, that are the same or similar across cultures and across the ages. All of that shit is like really fucking interesting to me. So... And, you know, and I just find it interesting, too, like, in his friendship with Freud. Freud, who was, um, you know, very, very, uh, very much a materialist, um, which I guess I would be, too. But I can see where the rift, like, came about between the two of them. So that's, like, a really, really interesting uh, mm -hmm. kind of dichotomy between the two of them. And, like, you know, so I just f I find that a really interesting uh, kind of thing. So... As I said, this is a massive, massive topic. I don't really have uh, a particular structure or anything about it. I just kind of want to... Yeah, I was, I was telling her, I said, Jenny, man, let's keep this shit under four hours tonight. She's like, it's going to take as long as it's going to take. <laughs> she told me to fuck off. She's like, it's going to take as long as I didn't long tell as you to fuck take. off. That is I a complete you, fabrication. <laughs> we got Joe Nash. Said, oh, hold on. What that, Jenny? Joe Nash says, stick around tonight, Tom. Make yourself a home. That's because last time I said, fuck it, and walked out of here. I wasn't feeling good, man. I was sick. I, know. I was sick. Jenny, he got Jenny's right. like, he's being a douche. <laughs> I caught it. I was watching this shit. Well, so, I yeah, know. I don't give a shit. I was like, not feeling good, man. I was tired of it. He's always like, yeah. and then I have to be I have to be sitting there all by myself going, yeah. hey, what's up? Sophie was up violently puking up acidic, acidic vegetables. Oh, no. Um, when so was she's that? she's ready to chill out. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't know. I think I guess it was yesterday. What's happened there? Night. I don't know. Soap might be coming for a visit in the next couple months. We'll see. Should we, should, we'll have her on the show. Um, let's see what's going on. Ken here. said, did you hear what they think they found that found out what happened with the outlaw pass? Yes, yeah, somebody, um, somebody sent me a link to this video. Um, and yeah, they might have figured out 
why the bodies were all beat up and why, you know what I mean? Like what probably killed him. It was just kind of like this, I can't even remember what it's called now, but it's almost kind of like a micro avalanche. An avalanche, yeah. Where it just kind of like the, the snow just kind of came down over them. And it's just, I pretty it much was, said that though. Well, no, yeah, we did. And it's, yeah. like, um, but they have like a really good, um, like little computer simulation of like what happened. Yeah. Like I love the computer simulation where they're showing like, here's the weight of the snow, and this is a little body down here, and this is what happens, and it's like, squish. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I was like, that's nice. Tila said it. It said that the Red Book was Kubrick's in, uh, inspiration for directing The Shining. I didn't know that. Well, isn't there isn't there a whole thing about that? Because isn't there a book in yeah. Allman's office that people are like, hey, it's the Red Book. Even though, like I said, it hadn't been published then. But everybody knew about it. Like, everybody that was yeah. into that kind of shit, like, knew that it existed. Just nobody had seen it. Um, so, hey, Tom, I made some... Michael Schaefer <clears throat> said, uh, Hey, Tom, I made some um, Pollock paneer and butter chicken in the Instant Pot last weekend. Turned out awesome. All right, cool. I, now, see, ev everybody has been... Yeah. Because I, I read a lot of food blogs and stuff like that because, like I said, I'm fascinated by food history and whatnot. And, man, everybody has gotten on this Instant Pot bandwagon. Yeah. People are making fucking cheesecake and that shit. People are making everything in there. Is it really as awesome as that? Or mm. do you need it if we already... Because we already have a crock pot, right? I just make it a... Yeah. What, what, are you what, are you, what, are you, what was the question again? The Instant Pot. I was what just saying that a lot of people... Um, you don't need it. Really, no, I'm just saying a lot of people really, really like it. Yeah. Because apparently it's like super easy and you can do all this uh, kind of shit with it, but we don't have one. We have a crock pot. Yeah. We have other kind of. Stuff. I don't. I don't know if we would to ever me, use it. To, to me, the pots are pots. I can cook in anything. You know what I mean? Fucking. The only thing that's going to matter is, you know, the quality of how the dish is going to turn out. And how long? How long is it going to take to cook it? Indian food takes too long to cook in a crock pot. I don't know about what the, you know. Yeah, we've never made thing. Indian food in the crock pot. Yeah, we no. usually just make it in like a regular pot. No, the dishes aren't really set up for that. Indian, yeah. Indian cooking really isn't supposed to take a long time. Although it's better the day day after. And the day after yeah. that. You know, it's Indian food, like up to, an, up to a point, it gets better like every yeah. subsequent day. Like it's good on the original day when you make it, but then yeah. like the next day it's really good. The next day it's even better than that. And the next day it's... And then after that it kind of starts to deteriorate. Tila said she saw a pain and gain said it was hilarious. I told you, it's like super funny. funny. That's the way Florida is. Yeah, that's, that's way Florida one is. of the most Florida movies. That's Florida as fuck. <laughs> that shit was Miami. Damn. <laughs> Although all the cities are starting to become kind of like Miami now. Every, like I said, Florida is kind of like all the crazy gets funneled down here. Yeah. Just kind of like just all the, you know what I mean? Because a lot yeah, of people say way, Florida is like you know America's wang. So yeah. everything just kind of gets funneled down here from the bladder of the other states, like down hey, into the. <laughs> I was watching this show. Okay, you guys, you guys know that I like those dead mall videos, right? Well, they got channels out there that are basically making <laughs> dead city videos, and these guys are making videos about all the most fucked up cities in the United States and how the economies work and how they don't work and just you know, even talked about Mississippi and shit. You know what I mean? Fucking which. Mississippi's a mixed bag, you know. It it ranks in at the bottom of all the statistics, but a lot of that has to do with uh, with Jackson. Jackson kind of throws everything. But anyway, um, what I was going to say is I was going to say that fucking we should feel lucky to live in Florida compared to some of these other fucking places that you could live in. They got... Well, there's a lot worse. So there's a lot, yeah. I'm not a big fan of Florida, because like I said, I was but, born here, so I'm kind of over it. She kind of takes it for granted. But, yeah. yeah, but, you know, I can see why other people would want to live here, for yeah. sure. But, Flor you know. Florida reminds me, you know, and, you know, I was born in California. Florida reminds me of California in the 70s, maybe early 80s, before it got really fucking crowded and really corporate. That's, it kind of reminds me of, 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 of California in the good old days. If you want to know what California was like in the good old days, watch Xanadu. That's about what it was like. That was a pretty accurate spiritual representation of the way it was. You know what I mean? Michael you could Schaefer. go down to the beach and you can go down to fucking Venice Beach and it wasn't fucking totally crowded full of people. It wasn't filled with fucking tourists and shit. It was like a like fun towns and cities. You know what I mean? It was, it was nice. That's the way Florida, the Florida's at that stage now. Everything's on a cycle. 
Everything, you know, yeah, Florida they, will eventually get shitty. It'll get worse. Well, yeah, it, and be, some parts of Florida are already shitty, but, yeah, you know. It'll become a fucking metropolis like fucking New York, and then it'll run itself into the ground eventually. Michael Schaefer said, didn't I call Florida, uh, Florida Satan's ass crack? I did. Yeah, um, it's hot. It's fucking hot. Yeah, yeah in, in the summertime, yeah. I, I really wouldn't recommend yeah. it. <laughs> Honestly, it just seems like if people are going to come visit Florida, unless you're super, super into having swamp ass, um, I would recommend. It's not that bad. It <laughs> is. Um, well, I would recommend coming here in like early spring yeah. or like late fall. Yeah. It's a late fall. It's still hot, but it's not as crowded. You won't die of, you know, fucking also, heat stroke every time you walk out the door. It's also going to depend on how much money you have. That too. If you're rich, you're gonna love fucking Florida, especially Miami, South fucking South Miami. But you got to be a millionaire, yeah, to really f appreciate it. Yeah, although there's good shit. You don't have to be a millionaire to appreciate Miami. Uh, if you're not a millionaire, li live up around the Orlando area, fucking where we live. It's nice. You like it? Yeah, it's not horribly yeah. horribly expensive. Some places are, but I oh, don't it's know. half the price of California. Yeah, easily. Yeah. You know, so you can still get a decent amount for your money, but, yeah. you know, I'm just saying. Um, so let me see. What, uh, what else do I have to say? Oh, I'm not really sure if I know we usually do um, a live matinee on Sunday, but I'm not sure we're either not going to do one tomorrow or it'll be a lot later because I'm going to go to Ocala to stop by and see my mom and my sister who was coming down to visit from Atlanta with her boyfriend. And I was just going to pop in and see them real quick. Cause I haven't seen them in a really long time. Mm -hmm. So I might drive over there and see them. So, I, so that's about like an hour and a half away from here. So depending on what time I get back, because I think she's going to be there like two in the afternoon, which means I have to leave here about 1230 and However long she's going to be there, I don't really know. And then I'll come back. So we'll either do a matinee either late later in the evening or just skip it and do another one like on Thursday when we wouldn't normally do one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how that goes. Did you, get a, so you got a, a movie today, didn't you? I know. that's the, that, that was the next thing I was going to okay. uh, say. So I wanted to give a shout out to Louie. We just got this like 10 minutes before we started the show. Louie sent me the Blu-ray of oculus mike flanagan motherfucker it. oh it's good what's that about it's about essentially it's a haunted mirror but okay. kind of but um yeah it's really good Let's i really like i really really like this movie okay. i saw i've seen it um but it was many years ago so you know mike flanagan is like a cool fucking dude and i've liked all his movies so he was the one that did uh he did dr sleep didn't he yeah yeah well, yeah, I got that too. Haunting of Hill House, you know. Oh yeah, we did yeah. buy Doctor Sleep, didn't we? Yeah, I bought a used copy for eight bucks. That's right. On Blu-ray. Forgot all about that. Yep. <laughs> also, didn't he do uh, Absentia? Also about the tunnel with the thing. That was like a good movie too. I think that might have been his first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hush was good too. That was the one about the um, the woman who was deaf, and it was like a. Like a dude was like stalking her, like outside her house. That was like really, really good. Trying to get some of this alcohol into my system, man. Yeah, you really need to like get yeah. on the ball, man. Trying to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> get that blood flowing. I mean, it's not. It's not like you woke up early this morning. I don't know you what it is. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm fucking. I felt like I've been beat up with a baseball bat, you know, because of the sickness. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm just trying to trying to snap out of it. Yeah. And I haven't been real, I haven't been real fucking, like, uh, optimistic, you know what I mean? Fucking, I've been kind of in, in the fucking dumps anyway, you know? Yeah. Um, we need to get the fuck out of here and have some fun. I got all this fucking shit to do in Florida. And, Well, uh, you can go with me tomorrow if you want. Maybe. We'll see. I don't like having to drive all that way anyway. I know you Because there's no it. fucking, there's no fucking cell phone service yeah. out there. <laughs> My mom lives out in the middle of the woods. I hate making that drive. I do too, but it's like, that's why I don't go that often. Yeah. But you know, I haven't seen him in a long time. Um, but so, you definitely need to go fucking see your people. Well, yeah, like I said, I haven't yeah. seen him in ages. And my sister, since she moved away, I haven't seen her for a couple of years. And this is kind of, kind of sucks because 
last year, she bought me tickets to see Nick Cave in Atlanta last October. But of course, it got canceled because everything else did. Because I was going to do a whole road trip and I was like going to go up and see her and stay with her for a few days and stuff like that. And of course, that didn't work out. So I'm very happy that she's coming down here. She's actually going to all the Disney parks, her and her boyfriend. They, they bought that multi-pass thing where it's yeah. like it's a different park every day. So I don't know how much that fucking shit costs. But yeah, they're doing that. So they, they're just like, they're coming down, they're driving down, and then they're going to stop at my mom's place and then go on to Kissimmee. And then I'm going to go have lunch with them like next Friday too, but I wanted to see them tomorrow because I haven't seen my mom in a long time either. <laughs> yeah, they're in there talking about Dr. Sleep. I thought Dr. Sleep was all right. Yeah, I mean, it's right. it's hard to... I mean, obviously, nothing's going to be as good as The Shining, which is, like, one of the best movies ever. Um, but I thought it was, like, a decent effort. I can see how it got, like, mixed reviews because some people were like, meh, and some people, like, really don't like it. But I kind of feel like it... it He did the best he could. I liked it. With... Yeah. yeah I liked and it. you know what I mean? And it's like, it was actually a lot better than I was expecting. I thought when he went back to the Overlook, I thought it actually picked up a lot. I thought that was a pretty good take on what the Overlook would look like to a fucking psychic. A person with a bunch of bunch of The Shining in him. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all kind of... I liked it. And it's good it how good. they kind of went in a different... Like, and it's weird because the movie... I actually liked the movie a little bit better because I wasn't crazy about the book, Dr. Sleep. Because um, I read it not too long before the movie came out. And I was just kind of like, meh. It's kind of like, you know, one of the more recent Stephen King books, which I'm really not that enthusiastic about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I just, I, I didn't really like the book. So I thought the movie was actually like better than the book, well, which is you know, one thing very, that I don't usually say. It's a very different tone. Uh, you know, you're not talking about a Kubrick movie. But I thought the whole psychic vampire angle was pretty good for the universe. Yeah, yeah. You know, for, in the Stephen King universe, it it made sense to me. You know what I mean? If you had yeah. people that fucking had The Shining, did you have fucking vampires feeding on it? Psychic vampires. That was, and, you know, it keeps them young. That's a fucking good idea, I thought. Well, and in some ways it kind of expands on the mythos because yeah. you could say that the Overlook Hotel itself was kind of like a psychic vampire yeah. also because it right. was kind of taking energy from people who had The Shining. Well, that's how I, that's how I thought... Right. The, the the shining was to begin with. Yeah. That it was a temple made made to that shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? On um, consecrated ground, they consecrated it with the blood of the Indians. Then they had like, you know, it was fucking evil rich people, and they had decorated the, their fucking basically their sacrificial temple with like they they kind of decorated it with the artwork of all their victims. You know, I thought it was pretty good, pretty cool. I know. Pretty I was... much a sacrificial temple. Yeah, kind of like a like a Mayan temple, temple basically. I wrote a whole big long thing. If you if yeah. you guys have never read my blog, go to my blog, Goddess of Hellfire, and I yeah. we we came up. Well, he came up with like this whole uh, thing about The Shining yeah. that it's not. I mean, it's not like a hundred percent original, but it's kind of like a take on it that I hadn't really seen before. You know what I'm saying? That I hadn't yeah. really read before. Um, so yeah, I wrote like a big long thing about it. It's really weird because a few days ago I got back into every, every now and then I'll get back into shining conspiracy theory videos. Just, I don't know why I just find them endlessly fascinating (laughs) and there's so many. So just the other day when I was working on something else, like I started watching one and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if I buy it, but it's interesting. And then it just like went to another one and I'm like, oh, why not? I've just... You know, I, I've accepted that today is just going to be a shining conspiracy theory day. Yeah. <laughs> like, while I'm working on shit, that's what's going the on. The Overlook basically... <laughs> was, was, the Overlook was, was a child was a child island man's island. It was like Epstein's island. And, and kind of like something from fucking... What was that? Uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Sacrificial yeah. Temple to Pervs. <laughs> rich powerful perverts well it was okay. a place you could go that no one was looking at you where yeah, you, you could kind of indulge your worst impulses yeah. but, but and like, get away with but it but in another dimension it was sucking all that shit up yeah well and yeah. that's I, I kind of feel like that was implicit in yeah. your theory was that 
the hotel itself was in essence alive and yeah. was kind of it, it drew those kind of people to it because it wanted the energy it wanted to feed off of all the that horrible negative shit that was happening so that's i mean that made complete and total sense to me yeah i saw one the other day and i was telling you about this it was i don't think that i buy this but it was interesting anyway and somebody made like an hour long video about it so i was kind of like yeah whatever somebody made a video saying that i can't remember who it was now but saying that if you watch the movie through the lens of Wendy is the one that has mental issues and that some of the stuff in the movie that's happening is her hallucination, they kind of marshaled a lot of evidence where they're like, they're like you know, all the, all the weird shit that happens. Like, you know, there's that really famous scene where Jack is in the... Um, you know, in his office or whatever, like in the, in that big room and like the chair is behind him and then it's not behind him. And it's like, so they're talking about all these kind of supposed inconsistencies like, Oh, now here, there's a, here's a light switch. And now there's not a light switch and all the shit about the, um, you know, the, uh, the geography of the hotel being all like fucking askew and everything. So they're saying, well, every time you see a shot where something like a light switch that was there is not there anymore, then what you're seeing is, subjective from Wendy's hallucination. Like Wendy is imagining all this. She's the one that um, strangled Danny in the room. She's the one that did this and that. And like I said, so I'm watching the video and I'm like, I'm not sure I buy this, but it's a yeah, pretty, it's too. a no, but it, it, it was a pretty compelling case that they made, even though I, I don't believe it. I think it's a reach. We know the original story. Yeah. We know what the fucking Kubrick was doing. We know there are mistakes in the edit. It, that's all, that's all it is. The chair thing was just a mistake in the edit. That's Thank you, Tila. Was. Thanks, T. Gotta take off now, but have a great show. Okay. Oh, shit. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Have a good time. Well, you can watch it later, T. Yeah, it'll it'll always be I'm there. I'm gonna have to get another drink. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. I still have, like, a quarter of one left. But, yeah, so, I don't know. It, it's just one of those things. Man, The Shining is, like, the one movie that I never... I don't think I ever, ever get tired of it. If, any, if somebody said right now, hey, wanna watch The Shining? Yeah. <laughs> which I don't I can't think of that many other movies that that have that same kind of rewatchability and I see something different in it every single time but it's weird because I didn't really realize I know there was like the chair thing and all that kind of crap but I didn't realize you know there's there's shit like you know like when Halloran like is showing uh Wendy and Danny around the big kitchen and like here's the freezer or the dry goods storage or whatever and it's like, then there's a light switch there, but then later there's not one. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, like Kubrick, for, well, for one thing, the whole inside, the whole interior of the Overlook in the movie is a set. So I don't understand how that could have been done um, accidentally that, oh, we shot this and it's like, no, there's a light switch and then there's not a light switch. Like, how does that happen? I just kind of feel like he did all that shit on purpose. Although I don't think that it's because he was trying to signal, hey, this is all Wendy's hallucination, like this person was trying to argue. I think that Kubrick did do it on purpose, but I think that he only did it to disorient um, the viewer. I, I kind of feel like that's what he was going for. Because I think that's the reason that he made the overlook not like the the architecture of it the interior of it doesn't make sense like where the windows are like where the hallways go shit like that it doesn't make any sense i think he just did that like to be like uh, you know what i mean yeah as a um <laughs> god damn okay that's just strong well you're the yeah. one that made it what are you yelling at me for <laughs> mm. i think he just did it as a cool. disorientation tactic you know what i'm saying it was awesome yeah Here. <laughs> yeah. Bees Nest says Poltergeist never gets old either. Too. That's a good movie. Yeah, I can watch that over and over. I mean, yeah, there are certain movies that I don't know. For some reason, I just I just never get sick of The Shining. Never. I've probably seen it a hundred times over my life. 
And, you know, like I was telling them, I said, even if you said it right now, if we want to watch it, I'd totally watch Michael it. Michael says, I, I can watch Marked for Death anytime. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Marked for you Death. Are marked for Death. Oh, my God. Actually, you know what I was getting ready to fucking watch again? I was getting ready to watch Under Siege 2. Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, really. Under Siege 2. Actually, I like Under Siege. That's fucking, that's, that's. I don't even know if I, did I even That's Seagal's best two? movie. Well, yeah. But Under Siege 2 wasn't that bad. It's just that it had a really shitty villain. Wait, what the happened? Was, what happened in part two? Part two, he's on a train, and he's trying to stop uh, terrorists that are on the train that are gonna gonna uh, activate a damn killer satellite. Basically, is what it is. It's not ringing. And the guy's supposed to be some kind of a. The villain is like a computer genius, but it doesn't. It didn't. It didn't age well. You know, it just didn't age well. But it's just more Seagal being Seagal, him fucking flirting with his niece. He's uncle, uncle fucking, uncle fucking Reebok or whatever his name was. I forget. Reebok. Reebok. <laughs> and they're like, dude, that's your fucking niece. And he's like, well, you know, you know how fucking skeevy he is. He's skeevy in the shit. Thank you, niece. Victor. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, uh, I don't know. He for real, like, now see, I must not have seen part two because yeah, it's Victor, Steven yeah. Seagal skeeving on his niece, I definitely yeah. would have remembered that. Yeah, and I don't think you've ever seen it. Sounds like I'm not really missing anything. No. <laughs> I've only seen it once. It's like, well, she's only kind of related. Yeah, I've She's only probably only half my age. Yeah. It's fine. Oh, yeah, she's like fucking 19. <laughs> he's probably about, I don't know, close to 40. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Stop it, Steven Seagal. Well, some guys I can buy that. There are certain rock stars that are out there that are fucking, you know, had had a way with, you know, like a fucking 40-year-old fucking David Bowie and a 20-year-old fucking chick. And, yeah, that shit was going down. Of course that would happen. But that was David Bowie. You're not talking about Steven Seagal. That's what I mean. You know I, I, don't, I don't think it's even it's so much the age. The age. <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's, it's the personality. The person it's, that it is. it's the person that it is, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying, like, I, I just, David Bowie just never came across as creepy to me. No. You know what I mean? And Steven then, Seagal just comes across as super creepy. There were some dudes that were fucking older, they were just fucking slinging mad fucking pussy, man. Fucking old, what, fucking, uh, uh, old, fucking dude from Rolling Stones. What, who, who am I thinking Mick of? Jagger. Mick Jagger. Yeah. I mean, he's ancient now. Yeah. But when Mick Jagger was in his 40s or 50s, that dude was still a man. I mean, fucking, you know, he was... He had, had a lot of girlfriends. I think he was married by that time, but... Probably. Yeah, you know. Even though fucking, you know... Whatever. Mick Jagger, whatever. <laughs> I st I'm still gonna fucking just give it to fucking um, David Bowie, though. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I feel like David... Hard to top that motherfucker. David Bowie could Hard get away with a lot just because he was David Bowie. He was David motherfucking Bowie. All right? He could do whatever he wanted. And he kind of came across as... Not really, as being something, like, greater than human. Yeah. Well, he, he wasn't skeevy. That's not, what I'm not, saying. Not he, he never was, gave me, like, a no. creepy vibe by no. any stretch of the imagination. He was, he, was, he was a fucking strange gentleman, but he was still a gentleman. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you didn't get that, like, no. fucking Chester the Molester vibe no. like you get from Steven Seagal. And he was, uh, <laughs> although, uh, truth be told, back in the Studio 54 era... He was dating, I think, like a 14 or a 15 year old girl. Yeah. Did you know about that? She was a famous. I heard about that, yeah. She was a, a famous club girl. You know, back in the 70s, it wasn't quite the same. You know what I mean? Fucking uh, age wasn't a, a big issue. They were all fucking high. She wasn't old enough to be in a club anyway, but she was, everybody knew. She was super famous scenester, and she was dating Bowie for a while. He was, I think she was, what, 14, 15? Something I can't like that. Now. And he would but he wasn't that much older than her, let's be honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mid to late twenties maybe? Yeah, you know? I mean it would be weirder it's not if he, like was he was like an old man. fifty and he's yeah. like going after teenagers. That's it's not like always old man. problematic. Now, I've seen pictures <laughs> of her. I saw pictures of her. She didn't look underage, she just looked like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> she she looked eighteen, officer. Where'd Ford? They didn't give you? a shit back then. They no, were fucking I know they selling didn't. so much fucking cocaine. At a studio of 54, and that's why the place got shut down, if I remember correctly. Among a, yeah. Got busted for fucking coke. 
Well, is it? I feel like seventies and eighties. There were no said. rules. Well, and I mean, everybody was fucking yeah. coked up around that they time. Didn't know, they didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, you have to give people a little bit of leeway. It's like, they, we, they man, we were so going. coked up, we didn't they know didn't what the know. fuck was going on. <laughs> but, uh, fucking. <laughs> yeah, fucking Bowie. Can't believe that dude died. Well, that's how it goes. But you know what? That bitch fucking died pretty. He did. He looked good his whole life. I'm te- like I I might have mentioned this before, but it's like I'm not one of those people. It's like gets bummed out about celebrities dying or anything yeah. like that. But David David Bowie dying really, really that really fucked me up. It really, really that really, really upset me. He was a, he was basically an old man when I was in high school. When I was in high school, he was in his forties, yeah. and I considered that to be an old man. But you know, back then. Now, you now at 51, you're at 40? That's a, that's a young Shut man. Shut up, that's not old. <laughs> well, fucking Arnold was fucking 41 during Predator 1. He doesn't look like an old man, does he? Uh-uh. He was like 40, 41. Well, that's the thing, though. When you're young, everybody seems like an old person. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when you're a teenager. It's like yeah. somebody's 30 and they're like, oh my God, they're fucking mm-hmm. ancient. Because I remember, I remember feeling like that, too. Yeah. So, they everybody does. <laughs> So he says, doesn't everyone go through a coke phase? And then Beastna says, I'm still in my coke phase. <laughs> I didn't go through a coke phase. Did she leave? Where'd she go? Yeah, Pookie went in there. Pookie was... They're talking about fucking Arnold Angela Ray. Bowie and fucking Mick Jagger and all that. Nobody knows what's true during that time. Those people fucking made up stories about each other to fucking magnify their legend. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, that, they were very. Based I mean, on nothing. they understood branding back and, then, yeah. and they were just kind of like, "Hey, man, yeah, the craziest shit that we can come up with, it's like the better." And, and they had fanzines back then. You know, there was no internet, so that shit would kind of come out in fanzines, music fanzines, but you never knew what was true because they would lie on purpose. They put all kinds of crazy press out, you know. Well, yeah, because it got them press. It that got was press, the whole right. point. Like, it didn't matter if it was bad press or good press or whatever, as long as it was press. They understood yeah. that back then, too. Yep. So, you know, you just made shit up. So, should we go ahead and start this fucking show? Yeah, we gonna, we're going to talk about Carl Jung. Yeah, we're going to just talk about Carl Jung. You know some shit about this, I know don't some shit do about you? Carl not? Young. You do. All right. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of his biography a little and then talk a little bit about kind of the context of the time i suppose because i guess it's really weird to think about nowadays but the shit that we talk about now in psychology like a lot of the formative ideas that people have about psychology not really a big thing like until you know freud and young and stuff like that came along yeah and i feel like their ideas even though a lot of their ideas have been you know, kind of fallen by the wayside, yeah. like as far as like scientific circles go, but they're, but they've really kind of leached into the public consciousness to such an extent that I think that people don't even realize that that's, that they came from like a single person or a, or a group of people. Yeah. And let's straighten something out before we talk about this any, any further. Psychology is not really a science. It's never been a science. Um, it's a lot closer to a philosophy. Because you can't really pr- prove what people are thinking. It's hard to prove things that psychology talks about. It's almost kind of like a high-class Scientology. Scientology is actually... L. Ron Hubbard was trying to replace psychology and get Scientology put in universities. That's how fucking crazy that motherfucker was. But it's not as crazy as you think when you look at psychology. Psychology is pretty fucking crazy, too. But it's not a it's not a science. It it's a philosophy. No, I mean it's psychiatry has more is of, more of a science. Is yeah. more of a science because that is. actually does deal right. with you know the structures of the brain. How yeah. does this structure of the brain affect people's behavior? Blah blah blah. Whereas psychology is much more yeah. nebulous. When I was a little kid, psychiatrists looked at psychologists in the same way we would look at a fucking Scientologist. They just say that's or a an pseudo- astronomer. You're an, ast- or, or, or <laughs> or an astrologist. That's like an astrologist. Astro- astrologist, not an astrologer. Yeah, because they're just like, ah, oh, stop it. That's not that. You know, you can't prove any of that. That's, that's not real. That's not a science. And um, psychology is, is is not a it's not a hard science. Now, 
doesn't necessarily mean that what's psychology what what psychology says like some of the things that psycho some of the some of the theories psychology has doesn't mean that there isn't anything to it i mean their psychology will talk about personality types and you can look at it and go yeah there are personalities like that that person does fit that personality type but that's not really saying much when you think about it i mean think about it Astrology does that too. I, I, I'm a Cancer. You know I mean? I'm a Sagittarius. Oh, you know I'm I mean? such a Libra. And then some of that shit does sound like it, it kind of fits, but it's fortune cookie stuff. But there is some use to psych psychology, I would think. There, there, there's, there's something to it. It's just that it's. It's not a science. And the it's thing, an art form. Yeah, and I think the thing too is that some people do find benefit in, you know, going to an analyst, say, yeah. and, you know, particularly a Jungian analyst yeah. and having their dreams interpreted. And so, you know, and they, maybe that makes them, you know, feel better or that maybe that makes them a better person. So I do feel like it has some value. But like you said, it's not like a hard science. No, I mean, you could go lay on a clay table and fucking do auditing too. They say the fucking audit, they love, Scientologists love auditing. They say there's something to it. That it makes you feel good, but talking to people makes you feel good. That's what that's what all. Well, is. talking about yourself. Yeah. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. Yeah. I think that's you know. Yeah. That that just might be the most cynical interpretation, gotta, but I do feel like people people love to talk about themselves and feel like somebody is listening to them. If you're self absorbed and validating their if you're self absorbed, you might want to consider becoming a Scientologist. Just don't join the Church of Scientology. <laughs> Become a free Scientologist. <laughs> a lot cheaper. Although Go you through might, the OT materials for free. Although you might get some of the squirrel busters showing yeah, up yeah, on your doorstep. Yeah. <laughs> the squirrel busters. Yeah. <laughs> oh you got, you got to be a real fan of the show to know what we're talking about there. Oh, Just goodness. look up squirrel busters on YouTube. You'll see. It's the People most knocking on your door ridiculous. Asking you about Marty Rathburn. <laughs> see, Marty is, you know, where is Marty? <laughs> <coughs> oh, man. I kind of, and as I said, I felt like this when I worked for them too. I just, to me, it seems like Scientology yeah. is a bunch of, it's role playing. um, well, it seems like a bunch of kindergartners who think that they're grown ups. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of like how it comes across to me. I don't know. They just come across as like a bunch of children, like play acting as adults, yeah. but they, play acting as, um, mentally challenged adults yeah. <laughs> let's put it that way that's uh that's how kind of i interpreted that they're telling me to put a feather in my hat and call it macaroni <laughs> you totally no, no, no. Sh you should this is my bush hat it makes me sexy <laughs> it's yeah. magical like that yeah <laughs> all right so um so carl young so he's born in switzerland now in 1875 now, it should be noted that, as I said, when he was born, this was kind of, um, you know, in in a time prior to psychology even being a thing. I think that it didn't really gain its footing until about 20 years later, uh, you know, with Freud kind of coming on the scene. And uh, as I said, we'll talk about that a little bit later because there was a big, um, you know, the two of the, the two of them, their the relationship between the two of them. A lot of their ideas are very similar, but they had like a very famous rift. And you know, looking at the way that they looked at things differently is kind of uh, instructive, probably. So yeah, so he's born in eighteen seventy five. Now, his parents were actually pretty poor. Um, his dad, I think he had started out as a linguist and he was like really good at it, but for some reason he just didn't have a lot of fucking gumption or a lot of go-getter whatever and uh so him and the whole family are kind of poor um so the dad is like a minister now the mom seems to have had some kind of mental issues let's call it that um i think carl young said later on that his mom would act totally normal during the daytime but then at nighttime she acted like super weird like she would act like really weird and mysterious she'd be like creeping around the house and like acting really bizarro i think he even said 
I was like reading a couple different biographies of him, like on Kindle Unlimited. And I think he even said at one point that he's like, one time I saw this figure coming out of my mom's room one night that was like this glowing woman with like no head. Well, she had a head, but like the head was like in front of the body. You know what I mean? Like the head was up here and like the body is by like a ghosty kind of shit or something. And like he kind of associated that with his mom. So I, so his mom like had some issues, um, you know, to depression, like whatever the other shit going on was. So I kind of feel like this whole dynamic might have played into his shit later on because he did have a thing where I don't want to say he wasn't like misogynistic or anything like that, even like for the time. But I think that he saw women as unreliable just because of what his mom was like. But he saw men as kind of like strong and decisive, but ultimately useless because his dad was kind of useless. You know what I mean? Because he couldn't really it was a different world make any money. Yeah. So I think that maker. that like kind of informed a lot of his later views. It would have looked that way, though. Think about it. Mm hmm. Because you had a you had a, a society where women basically, they weren't that educated. Maybe they had some school, you know, when they were in high school. It probably wasn't much. But you're raising all these guys who are like the head of the household, and they gotta fucking keep shit under control. And you know what I mean? Oh yes, don't I'm not at my table. You know what I mean? So <laughs> they're kind of like your local governor, but they're only in charge of the house. Yeah, government's fucking treating them like bitches though. You know, in the off hours, telling them what to do. So, they're, when you're a kid, they seem powerful, but they're not powerful versus the government. The government's bossing them around. And then your mom and your sisters, they're just, your sisters are just women that get married off. They're girls to get married off to some dudes. Yeah. You know what I mean? And your, your mom is just somebody who takes care of the children. You know what I mean? She doesn't have much of a role outside of that. So, you know, most countries are like that. You know, South America is a lot like that. You know, I mean, it's, I guess you say it's very, it's very defined gender roles. I, I don't know if it's like that anymore, but it was when I was growing up there in the 80s. You know, women just um, would be, you know, they're kind of like what he's talking about. You know what I mean? They're just fucking, they kind of come off as. Uh, Thank you, Kat. Being under the thumb of other people, and they don't have much power on their own. There's not much to them. They're housewives. That's yeah. How, that's how they come across. But uh, he's saying this from the point of view of a kid, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of a child growing up in this environment. Probably wouldn't look that way to another adult, though. But it's for, it's formative. Well, you know the, I mean? yeah. And I, I kind of feel like both Young and Freud, I think they may be... I don't know. I don't want to say they... They project a lot. Well, yeah, and I don't want to yeah. say they overestimate because shit that happens to you in your childhood is obviously yeah. very formative to like, yeah. you know, it, it does like form a lot of the basis of your, um, you know, your opinions later on. Yeah, but you go back and look at it, it's, but, not, it's not realistic. Yeah, I do think that maybe they put a lot more yeah. emphasis on there than perhaps was warranted. Yeah. Because I do feel like... What it really was, and I always thought that these guys, because even as a kid, I'd read about... Carl Jung and fucking, uh, fucking, what's his name? Fucking, um, Freud. Freud. And they're always talking about childhood development. And as a teenager, I'm like, man, these motherfuckers are hung up on, on some really fucking childish shit, really. You know what I mean? Because even, even at the age of 15 or 16, I was looking at that going like, that's kind of weird that they've kind of yeah. hung up on, on this shit. I think they were just kind of men of their times. And they're fucking blown. Yeah. They're looking into shit. They looked too deeply into things, if you ask me. If you went back and probably looked at his mom and looked at his dad, it was just desperate people trying to survive. That's all it was. Yeah, I mean, particularly his family, because they were kind of broke dick. Um, right. Because his dad was, you know, a, a kind of a small town parson, essentially. Yeah. Um, they did actually move to somewhere a little bit. Like, he got a little bit better shit later on. But I do kind of feel like... I, I do kind of feel well, and and it could be too that people are, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. And if you look back at someone's childhood and then you look at their subsequent development, that you know, especially when they're really famous or they're really famous for a particular, you know, psychological type of thing. So I feel like 
maybe how they were brought up is given a lot more more weight weight than maybe yeah. it would have otherwise yeah um you know i know that you know my memory of things when i was a kid don't really match up with reality like you know i'll remember a place a certain way and if you go back there later on you're like oh that's all it was i remember this place being a lot bigger more more yeah. important looking Nah, it looked bigger and more important to you because you were fucking because you were little 13 yeah. 14 at the time just just another mundane place you know what i mean and your fucking upbringing was just kind of normal for the situation you know what i mean it, it seemed real important to you when you were a kid because that was the first time you did some shit that's really what well, really yeah, is. and things do seem a lot more important to you when you're a kid, just yeah. because that's kind of the nature of being a kid. Everything right. is just like a big deal because it's like you said, it's the first time you're being exposed to certain things, yeah. certain concepts, whatever. So it's gonna seem like a lot more significant. But then when you go back and revisit it, it's just kind of like, you know, stuff that I found like a really big deal when I was little, like whether it was a movie or whether it was a place I went or something like that. And then you go back and see it later. You're like, well, that's, and it's was. completely yeah. not the same as yeah. what you remembered it as. Cause you like built up this big fucking structure around it in yeah. your head. And that's not at all what it was like. It, to me, a lot of psychology, Freudian psychology is that building up a lot of shit into your head. Into yeah. Your and head. I do kind of feel like I'm going to give, I mean, although I understand like, you know, neither one, neither Freud nor Jung, um, even though we talk about them a lot still like in psychology and whatnot, um, you know, but in real, you know, like I said, scientific circles, they're kind of, a lot of their ideas have kind of fallen by the wayside, Yeah, but I can see why, there was such a rift between the two of them. And in that sense, I would give Jung the upper hand because Freud, I feel like, oh my goodness. What was, what's that? They're abducting them children. Oh shit, man. Do we, is, was that an Amber Alert? Yeah, leave them children a fucking long. I didn't man. get one on my phone. Usually I get yeah. one on my phone. Oh it's because I restarted it. Oh, okay. Um, but I do feel like Freud was way too focused on... <coughs> sexuality i, th yeah. I, th I and think toilet he, training yeah i think he felt like yeah. everything could be um you know kind of it, it, it was a very reductive way of looking at things yeah because it's like everything every neurosis that you have yeah can be kind of distilled down to some like sexual shit yes yeah, and i think even and, and it's weird because even when young was around um, other colleagues of Freud were starting to say that too. So it's yeah. not just a modern thing that we're casting back. They were Even like, at the time, too much about having they were just kind of like, yeah, I just think that that's too, it's too narrow a focus. So was, like, even back then people were saying yeah, that. Yeah, I've noticed that he was always coming up with fucking shit about fucking Oedipus complexes with your mom and fucking toilet training stuff. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of like, it's, it, it's kind of odd, you know what I mean? It, it, when you think about it, it's very odd. It's just as odd as shit as, as L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. You know what I mean? L. Ron Hubbard was saying everything goes back to the fact that your mom tried to kill you when you were in the womb. Ain't that some shit? Because all moms try. All to do moms that. try are trying pow, to pow, kill pow. you when you're in the womb. That was fucking L. Ron Hubbard's baby. fucking. That was L. Ron Hubbard's uh, explanation for why you're so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> and are like that that happened in l ron hubbard's imagination yeah you know what i mean and and then he's 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 fucking projecting that into everybody else's imagination that has always been your so... mama tried to kill you when you were in the womb i'm like maybe and your mama did yeah well he thought his mom <laughs> did i think so therefore you know so therefore everybody's, therefore everybody's well see yeah. that's that's your problem right there i think the the main problem with that way of thinking which is maybe why it strikes me as so very funny is that your experiences, uh, to a large extent, cannot be universalized. No. Um, other people's, uh, other people are different from you. <laughs> These yeah. flash. So it's like, just because you experienced this when you were growing up, just because your parents sucked, just because this happened to you or you had this particular, that's your thing. You can't generalize that to everybody. Yeah, and another thing is just like, just because when you were a kid, you got into a fight with some other kids and you somehow got embarrassed or something, that doesn't mean those kids even remember 
that shit happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that, that's that same thing. Everyone's fucking experience of childhood is very different from other people's experience of childhood. Yeah. Your childhood experiences are unique. And they're also not accurate. The, the way you remember shit is not how it happened. Yeah. Because you were just, a kid. You were a kid. You don't have the ability... Your brain's to re- kind of amorphous. Yeah. You don't have the ability to remember things accurately. And you remembered things in an intense way only because it was intense for you at that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it wasn't... If you were to see it happen to another kid, you'd be like, oh, that's all it was? Yeah. You know what I mean? Let me get you another drink. Yeah, it's like yeah. that's the thing. It's like, you know, and I think that's really... it. Maybe it's it's kind of like a lot... Uh, I think it's a lot better now because uh, people are a lot more aware that everyone's perceptions, everyone's experiences are different and it's, it's like unique to them. But I do feel like particularly back then, um, you had some fucked up shit happen to you in childhood and all of a sudden you're going to grow up and generalize it and suddenly everybody ha- has that now and that's the explanation for everything and you're going to like write books and a whole fucking theory about it. But, you know, I don't I don't know if you would necessarily do that nowadays. But, you know. Um, so, yeah, where was I? So, Carl Jung, uh, not surprisingly, was a pretty uh, introverted kid. Now, as I said, it does seem like he had some... I guess he got picked on and bullied a little bit like that because his family was poor, um, you know, among a lot of the other families in the area. And, um, you know, his mom suffered from depression and various other things. So that might have affected uh, his outlook as well. Now, an interesting thing that he seems to have developed quite early on, and I don't think that he was, oh, thanks. I don't think he was particularly secretive about it either, was that he almost developed, I don't want to call it a split personality because it wasn't exactly that. It was kind of like... He was like, well, one part of me is just this, you know, normal person growing up in Switzerland in this time period. The other part of him was like, and he was a kid at the time, like a kid, a teenager. But the other part of him was, which he called personality number two, was like a wise old man, but like from the 18th century. Like he was picturing him with like the buckle shoes and the wig and all that kind of stuff. So he kind of thought, I don't know if he thought of it literally like that, but he almost kind of thought of it like he had two personalities in one body. Like he was like a kid or a teenager that was like a modern Swiss citizen. And then he had this other persona or this other part of his personality, which was like a wise old man from the past. You know what I mean? So he had that kind of whole thing going on. Now, um... One thing happened, so as I said, he was very into, even as a kid, he was really into esoteric kind of shit. He really liked coming up with like little things that were like, I don't know, ceremonial or he he took great delight in that type of thing, I guess, because he didn't really have a lot of, you know, a lot of friends or he was very quiet or whatever. So he kind of like really got into making his own symbols or making his own little ceremonies, giving meaning to his own type of like little activities in that sort of way. Now, one thing that happened to him when he was about 12 years old, so he's at this school in um, Basel, Switzerland, right? And this other boy pushes him down on the ground. And he apparently whacks his head really hard, like, on this fucking part of the curb or whatever. And it knocks him out for a little while. Now, he was not a big fan of school prior to this. Um, He was kind of one of those kids where it seemed like... I mean, obviously, he was very intelligent. But it seemed like he used a great deal of his intelligence in trying to avoid work rather than just, like, doing the work and getting it over with. You know what I'm saying? Like, he he, he expended a lot of his uh, energy and intelligence in, like, shirking. You know what I'm saying? Like, getting around stuff. So when he um, fell on the ground and got knocked out, he said that the first thing that he thought when he woke up from being unconscious was, hey, I don't have to go to school anymore now. 
Because, like I said, he hated school and he didn't want to do any work. Um, so as it happened, that did kind of work out for him for a little while. Because what would happen was that every time that he would go to school or every time that he would think about schoolwork, he would pass out. So I'm sure it was like some kind of hysterical kind of thing or Be- whatever because he wasn't into it. Hold on one second. Bees Nest in there. Fuck with me. Bees Nest, shut the fuck up, bro. <laughs> I'm trying to fucking do the show. He keeps fucking fucking What did he say? Just me I'm fucking it, I'm drinking it. with my fucking hat and my fucking big head and shit. Your big head. <laughs> he says my head's fucking too big. I fucking open my fly and pop his big ass fucking head out. Come at you. You can see bees, Ness. <laughs> Mexico won't save you, bitch. The bitch goes to Mexico fucking every fucking week, working down in Mexico, chasing them fucking Mexican girls. Where's my tequila, bitch? What, did he say he was going to send you some? Constantly telling me, I'm going to send you some tequila. That bitch didn't really fucking send me no tequila, cheap-ass motherfucker. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh, my God, you're getting so cranky. He's already getting cranky. Because I'm drunk. And fussy. No, I got shit I got to do. I'm trying to finish this fucking show. Dude, we just started. I know. I mean, an hour ago. We yeah, started. an hour ago. I know. But, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, the more you help me talk about Carl Jung, the the sooner we can get this over with, if that's yeah. what you want. I'm having a good time. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. They're in there laughing now. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about your tequila. So he says, man, shut the fuck up, bitch. <laughs> I didn't forget about my tequila. <laughs> Goes to Mexico every fucking day. Saying, oh, I'm going to get you some The place some is like a wash with I'm tequila. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to get you some tequila. And then oh, no he, shit, fucking, man, we just then he shows the... me what tequila is going to get me. Some fucking Bojack-ass, cheap-ass fucking te- rot gut tequila. Said, man, fucking keep that shit down there. <laughs> if you're going to send me some fucking tequila, that shit's going to be some... Dude, if you're going to send me fucking tequila... I'm, I'm, I'm in fucking Florida, all right? We got good tequila here. I, I'm fucking drinking Exotico right now. <coughs> The best tequila in Mexico, ask fucking Conor Vatslan, or ask him. He's going to say it's Milagro. Milagro. That's what they fucking drink. Which you can get that here. You can get that here. That's next to nothing. They sell it everywhere. You need to give me some tequila. Give me some fucking craft tequila. All right. (laughs) Something where some fucking Ricardo Monteblan motherfucker dipped his nuts in that shit before it went over there like that. It's like some special (laughs) shit. Yeah, yeah. He did something to that. You know what I mean? Some craft fucking tequila. I, you know what? I would love it if somebody made a craft tequila and that was the whole commercial. He was just somebody like it. dipping his nuts in it and then going. Yeah, and he did, <laughs> and he does the shit in slow motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah That's they what even, I'm they picturing. They even got it if it is like, like that, like that. And then he shakes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would totally buy that. Come on. So Yeah, yeah I know you would. So would you. Nah. Come on, that's funny. It is funny. It's just <laughs> I, I wouldn't drink it. I mean, I'd buy it. I wouldn't drink it. You're like, man, it had your nuts in it. <laughs> yeah, but did it really? Because they're just this, they're just trying to make a funny but commercial. I, but on my nuts, I rubbed some good habanero juice on it before I went. See? Well, yeah, that's. Yeah, it's like some habanero fucking. You know what? Habanero, I kind of feel like you could probably oil f- find a, like a niche market shorn nuts. for that kind of stuff. What's that? You could probably find a niche market for that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. It'd be like some kind of fucking weird... You can sell any fucking motherfucking yeah, thing on the yeah. internet. I'm just telling you. It'd be some kind of fucking weird... As thing. long as you can like afford to make a funny-ass commercial. Look how yeah. well the fucking... No, oh, now they're going tequila with cheese showing up. And they, they just got in from Mexico and all that... Yeah, Tom say, likes tea bag tequila. <laughs> yeah, Sophie says Tom signing up for that commercial. Yeah. I mean, I I'm gonna tell you right now, like the Louis the, going, it's good. Louis Hernandez going, it's just good. <laughs> I mean, if you like really do a funny commercial, Ken says we're nuts about our tequila. Yes, yeah, easy. <laughs> That's an awesome the fucking tagline. That's an awesome tagline. I'm it telling is. you, D's nuts tequila. Yeah. That's what Kid Cat says. Yeah. God damn. It's kind of like, like I said, look at all the, be- like the funniest fucking commercials. Well, that I thought were fun. I don't see a lot of commercials. I only just see them if they go viral because I don't watch a lot yeah. of, you know, I don't watch any TV or anything. But it's like, look at the shit. Like, what was that squatty potty type of thing with like the fucking, uh, the unicorn that like shit out little poops, but that looked like, uh, you know, soft serve ice cream. Yeah. Okay. They had that. 
You had your poopery commercials. Hilarious. Um, also, I'm a big fan of the fucking uh, Squatch. They're like handmade soaps. If you guys haven't seen those, I don't know how well this business is doing, but those commercials are hysterical. Those are the only commercials that I'll actually, like if it's in front of a YouTube video, I'll just watch the whole commercial. I don't care if it's two minutes long because that shit is fucking funny. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, there's like soap for men. So it's just, and they lean right into it. Like they talk about your fucking nuts and your sad, like withered balls and all that. Oh my God. So, so, so funny. Damn. They're so funny. They just like make me laugh every single time I see them. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, if you're going to go that way, then just go all in with the shit. Mm. I like it better that, cause remember back in the old days, you know, if you had commercials for like maxi pads or some shit like that, and it's like, they always had to be all cagey about it. Like, look, we're pouring some blue liquid into this maxi pad to show you that it works, even though yeah. that's totally not, it's like, looks like watered down Windex or whatever. Yeah, because it's like, blood, yeah, it's like, we can't show Man. like the real thing, which yeah. I'm not saying that you necessarily have to do that. Well, the but the blue was like, pretty. I guess, but it's just, it really does seem like, I like nowadays that they're willing to just kind of show shit the way it really is. You know what I mean? Instead of like being all euphemistic there were about lot, there the was, shit. There was a lot of missed opportunities. I mean, when it came to marketing. Now we're getting off subject, but. That's all right. That's what we always do. It was like, uh, you know, I'm a big Billy Idol fan, especially back in the day. You know I mean? He hasn't made any good fucking albums in a while, but. Hey, you know what I mean? Rock stars have they have a they have a fucking sell by date. You know what I mean? But remember the song "Rebel Yell"? Yeah. He was talking about a whiskey called "Rebel Yell." Yeah. Why wasn't there a fucking marketing campaign for "Rebel Yell" whiskey at that time? I mean, it was rot gut. But they should have just rolled with it and made that. Yeah, fucking rode punk- on those coattails, man. Yeah, they should have made that like the punk rock fucking "Rebel Yell" whiskey. Even though it was a northern company that owned that brand. And it was like some kind of fucking two-bit two bit distillery that was making that shit at that time. Man, but they could have cashed in. Should have cashed in. I mean, fucking, she, I would yeah. love to have some Rebel Yell whiskey fucking getting drunk as shit. Fucking listening to that fucking Billy Idol album. Mo, mo, yeah, mo, 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 with a Rebel Yell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Sophie says, now the pad commercials and pussy cleaners are pretty much no filter from what I say on YouTube. See, I like that better because mm-hmm. I don't like this euphemistic, oh, we're being so cute. It's like, look, we're pouring like blue shit into the... I'm like, that's not what that's for. Well, Why are you... If you remember how mainstream television was I know, it used to like, it used to piss me off. It was, television was so mainstream. So I'm so happy now that like... Generic, just, generic, generic... Yeah. And now they're like, they don't care who they offend, so that's good. (laughs) Look, I was telling you people earlier on what happened to fucking Mississippi and what destroyed the fucking culture of the South. I was there. I was fucking there. I know what destroyed Mississippi. It was fucking MTV. MTV and cable television. Well, yeah, because they're like, oh my God, that's what the world looks like? Okay, that's like a lot better than what we have going on here. Bye. (laughs) In Mississippi, every fucking kid that I knew that was growing up with in Mississippi, they're all gone. They all left the the South because of MTV. You know? And now you have Mississippi, a fucking collapsing, fucking shrinking, fucking uh, um, uh, shrinking fucking population. You know what I mean? With a fucking... It's just... There's no reason to be there. But back in the day, there was a reason to be in these little places. You, they had people that were just growing up and living their whole lives in these little towns. Happy. You know, their own lo- local cultures and local economies, all gone. All gone. And um, in, a, in a weird way, it's kind of sad. You know, in a weird way, it's, it's kind of sad. Everybody moving to these fucking large... Everybody's moving to large suburbs, basically. That's... That's the future. But there was, you know, I was there. The fucking small town life. It was like little Mayberries. You know what I mean? There was a, It was a reality unto itself. You could have a little retail job. You know, all gone now. Yeah, all it's gone. like, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like, it, that whole kind of shit is a double-edged sword. Like, I'm yeah. all kind of, 
I get like, you know, we, yes, we like our local community and yes, we like, you know, it's the flavor that it has, which is like nowhere else. Mm. But small towns also have a really dark side of, hey, we don't like anybody that's different and we don't like, you know what I mean? So well, it's, it's kind of like a, you know. That wasn't the problem. The problem it's, was nepotism. That was the real problem. If you weren't related to the right people, you'd never get the good jobs. Well, that too. That was I mean. really the main problem. But, you know what I mean? Each little community had its own thing. And they were all interrelated to begin with, anyway. You know what I mean? You can't democratize reality. Cat says, now it's all really meth berries. <laughs> yeah. True. But it doesn't matter where you go, whatever country. You know, if you go to India, everybody's Indian. It was, just, it was the same, It's the same thing. When you went to Mississippi, everybody was from Mississippi. Mississippian. They were all Mississippian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so where was I? Okay, so... Yeah. Um, right, so little Carl, like I said, he gets knocked out and then wakes up and says, hey, this means I don't have to go to school anymore. Um, so he was very excited about that because he didn't really like school and he just wanted to, like, skive off all the time. Now, so he basically just did that for a while because he got out of school for like six months by just like passing out every time. He's like, oh, I'm going to school. Oh my God, I'm going to pass out because like dudes back then were drama queens, you know. So <laughs> I just kind of feel like from reading a lot of Victorian era literature, the dudes back then, I mean, they just like passed out all the fucking time. You know what I mean? Where? What are you talking no, about? No, I'm just saying like all the... Like, I read a lot of Victorian fiction. Yeah, they fainted a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and so I feel like they were just so delicate. I think they fucking faked it. <laughs> I think they did. Too. To get out of doing shit they didn't want to do. Well, I think that's kind of what Carl was uh, was going for. He just, like, every time he was, like, going to school, he's like, oh, God, I'm so ill. But he would, like, well, pass out. I think, so he didn't have to go because he didn't want to go to school. I think that's why. I think fainting was basically virtue signaling. Oh, my God, I'm sh- I'm shocked. I can't take this. And then you I'm clutching faint. my pearls. Oh my god, it's too much. Summon my fainting couch. Yeah, Summon my fainting that's what it was. Yeah, it's just. Some people were saying. Well, some people said. Well, it was because their courses. All were their too clothes tight. were too tight. I don't think so. I think it was. Well, ba- it I, that was... might have been part. Well, th- I don't where so. women were concerned, that might have been partially because I've worn corsets a, a lot, and uh, yeah, I, I, some, I could see that happening. Yeah, but I've known some gothic girls that were fucking just corseted as shit with little bitty tiny waists. And as long as you fucking ratcheted it up slowly, well, you, yeah, but that's the thing. You, you had know, to like slowly that's, that's work up to was. that. I think it was all what you would call today virtue signaling. You see something you don't like, so you faint, and that proved to everyone else that you were a dangerous. How flower. shocked, shocked, how you shocked were. you were. Yeah, you I can't I even was. deal with this right yeah, now. Yeah, I can't deal with that shit. My consciousness is checking out. That's right. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm having an out of body experience. <laughs> It was bullshit. <laughs> probably. Bullshit. Well, yeah. and like I said, I think in Carl's case it probably was. Because like yeah. I said, he didn't really like going to school. He wasn't, um, he wasn't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'd call him lazy necessarily, but he wasn't yeah. a real like, you know, oh, let's do all the schoolwork or anything. So I kind of feel like that he liked to get out of uh, schoolwork when he could. So when he had the head injury, he kind of had an excuse. So I do kind of feel like he was fainting sometimes when maybe physically he didn't really need to. But so he did that for a while. He got out of going to school for like six months. And then he didn't really get his shit together until allegedly, and he said this later on, he overheard his dad talking about him one day. Like his dad was basically saying, because his dad was a minister and he was fucking broke and he was getting broker as his days went on. And the dad was kind of like, man, I'm getting broke. Um, the kid probably has epilepsy. He's like, I don't know how this kid's going to support himself when he gets older. And I'm just like at a loss as to what he's going to do. And Carl said that that was the first time that he had ever considered that he would have to make a living of his own someday. And that scared the shit out of him. So apparently he got his crap together and didn't really faint anymore after that, which, like I said, just kind of leads me to believe that it was probably bullshit to start with or just like in a, a way of getting out of shit. And he just, like, went, he buckled right the fuck down into his studies. Obviously, all his grades, like, improved, everything like that, because he started to get scared. He's like, well, shit, I have to make a living. He didn't have, like, a family to fall back on because his family was poor. So, uh, so yeah, that got a, that lit a fire under his ass. Now, 
apparently he had been contemplating maybe going into like being a minister or something like that like his dad was and I guess his dad thought that he was going to go into that line of work too although he wasn't like super into the idea I guess he had a lot of other relations that were also clergymen I think that his main thing he wanted to um study archaeology I think was like his first thing or zoology he wanted zoology or archaeology or something like that but the problem was that his family was poor <coughs> And the only university that they could afford to send him to was the one, uh, you know, in town in Basel in Switzerland. And they offered neither zoology nor archaeology. So Carl was just kind of like, well, shit, um, how about I will study psychiatry and medicine because those were available at that university. So that and he would be able to get a grant so his family wouldn't have to put up a whole bunch of money, which they didn't have. So that's what he started doing. So 1895, he started studying medicine at the University of Basel, um, which actually was very, uh, turned out to be really interesting for him because as I said, studying psychiatry, like kind of, it, it went into like his rational side and also kind of his interest in anthropology, history, that kind of stuff. So it kind of encompassed everything. So he kind of got into it. Now, 1895, as I said, was also the year that kind of uh, Sigmund Freud came onto the scene with, you know, one of his very famous, uh, you know, first publications. So this was probably like the best time to be getting into that field. Now, about a year after he was at university, his dad died and the family was left uh, pretty destitute. So other relatives had to kind of like pitch in and like help him so he could finish his uh, studies. So 1900, he moves to Zurich and he starts working at this psychiatric hospital under this dude named Eugen Bloiler. I hope, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Now Bloiler, uh, significantly, was a colleague of Sigmund Freud, who at this point was already starting to get kind of famous um, for his uh, publications. And so... Basically, around this time, Jung starts to, in 1903, he publishes his dis dissertation. Now, his dissertation, interestingly, because like I said, he was always interested in science, but he was always also interested in anthropology, in spirituality, religion, all that kind of stuff. So he had gotten real into spiritualism, as a lot of people were at the time. He had a um, cousin named Helen Pricework who was a medium. And I guess he had been to some of her seances and he had started developing like some theories about, uh, you know, paranormal activity or what was causing it or whatever. So that was the subject of his dissertation. Uh, the dissertation being titled on the psychology and pathology of so-called occult phenomena. That was his, you know, what the paper was called. So, here, you know, here very early on, we see this kind of his interest in both scientific rationality and his interest in spirituality kind of. Yeah, but what's funny is that during those days, there wasn't a big division between there the There really wasn't, which you really I, have to take into consideration. Right. I mean, there was a lot of people that, um, you know, uh, the spiritism movement was actually fucking pretty directly related to science. Uh, I mean, you're dealing with societies that basically were biblical. So, of course, spiritism and the supernatural is going to be part of science. You know I mean, that's just the way it, is, the way it was. And I find that, was, I find that time Bible period... The still ruled. Yeah, I time. find that time period, like, really, really fascinating because, like you said, um, you know, biblical literalism was still very much a big thing. I mean, you know, you have to think, like, Darwin... Yeah. didn't publish on the origin of species until 1859 and even then it was like pretty controversial not in scientific circles but in within the public so i kind of feel like a lot of people were still in the sway of ascent, what we would nowadays call creationism yeah well the bible said there are souls yeah the bible said that creationism happened and so science kind of agreed with that you know what i mean to to, to disagree with that was almost kind of like an anomaly. Think yeah. about it. You know. Yeah. When uh, when Darwin started to say, "Well, no, um, species differentiated d 
do through natural selection. That was a big deal. It was a massive deal. That. It was like what they it, call a paradigm shift. Right. They're Nowadays. like, well, you know, the natural fucking world bred things into being what they are. They weren't created as they are. They fucking bred themselves through the through a pro, through the process of nature. Yeah, and, that's and an not essentially what the in says. and an essentially indifferent process. Yeah, yeah. The Bible did not say that, right? And, and most of your scientists did not say that. A lot of people are fucking are like, "What are you talking about? Science? Sci- Science was not secular up until even to recently." I mean, physics, which was old fucking Isaac Newton, okay, was a secularist. Not a, I mean, excuse me, a sec, was a bibli- he was not a secularist, okay. In fact, Isaac Newton was deep, deep into fucking um, what do you call it when you're trying to find the source of alchemy? Stone? Alchemy. He was an alchemist. Yeah. Okay, so Young was into that too, actually. Yeah. So. <laughs> You know, these, these people believed in paranormal stuff and supernatural stuff. But they it wasn't it. weird. There wasn't no, like a like big normal. dichotomy. Like nowadays, it's a big dichotomy between, you know, you're a skeptic, you're a rationalist. Yeah. There, it, there wasn't that, that, that of, distinction back then. It was and, a lot grayer. Which kind of should give you a, kind of a different light on the works of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein. Okay. Because uh, she was also in that world. She wrote a story about somebody that brought a corpse back to life. You know, Frankenstein. And, First uh, science fiction story, yeah, really, by all like, accounts. Whoa, you know what I mean? And and uh, today you go, yeah, that's that, you know, bringing a corpse back to life. Maybe something like that might be possible. But that's even weirder back in her day when you're worried about souls. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You're like, well, where does that soul come from? You brought somebody back to life. Did, did they come back from hell? Yeah, it was a much bigger habit? consideration. It was a bigger back consideration then. back then than it would be nowadays. Yeah, nowadays it's just like, well, you know, your your consciousness is an emergent property of your brain working. So of course you you gain consciousness because you were brought back to life. Right. But you're a new person. That's not really what that meant in Mary Mary Shelley's. I kind of feel version. like they felt like souls were like a you know a a discrete. It was a thing. thing. It was a right. thing. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So it had to come from somewhere. It had to go somewhere. Yeah, and what what did that do? Did that soul have to leave heaven in order to fucking go into this body? Right. This or was like serious hell? discussions right. that they had. Which, like I said, right. I'm not making fun of them. That would, they was just... That was the normal That was the normal thinking of the time. That was the normal sure. scientific thinking of the time. Where'd that soul come from? Right. I mean, back then you had people like weighing, you know, people that were dying and like then weighing them a few minutes later to see like what the difference, like how much does the soul weigh and all this other kind of stuff. You had all that kind of stuff going on. That was a very serious consideration that they had. Yeah. So, you know, but and I'm like fascinated by, I mean, I've always been fascinated with, you know, not so much spiritualism itself, but the whole context surrounding it and like people that um you know were into it and even yeah. like you know people that were ostensibly like scientists and stuff like that that were into it and i just find that really really interesting and like i said that's not to like shit on people at all because i don't like necessarily to take our modern sensibilities and you know impose them upon people from the past because You know, they didn't know the shit that we know nowadays. But I just, I find it really interesting how different lines of thought emerged, I guess. Which is, which is, like I said, I, I found like the whole process of researching Carl Jung and Freud and everything like that. I knew a little bit about them before this, but I, you know, reading a bunch of books about them, I'm really fascinated by the whole context of their time period and like where they were coming from because you have to think nowadays topics like you know the collective unconscious or topics like word association tests even shit like that introversion extroversion stuff like that you have to think that you know to us it seems very like old hat but back then it was very very modern very very cutting edge this was something that you know Jung and Freud and people like that came up with back then in the context of the time being in the late 19th century when this was not 
a thing. This was not a thing that a lot of people in the public like knew about. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and don't think that we've conquered it today either. We well, still don't know what we've fucking... never we're never going right. to come to the end. There's right. always something else to learn. We you can't know? explain consciousness. Nobody really knows what it is. Is it inside the brain? Is it outside the brain? I think it's outside the brain in a quantum field. Or it, it might be a combination. It might be partly yeah. inside, partly outside. There might be some kind of you know, who knows? It's like I think the brain has is where memory is stored. I'm not sure that's actually where consciousness is. You know. That's just on my personal experience, though. And, like, uh, even uh, some of your, uh, oh, what's his name? Fucking Roger Pembrose. Penrose, yeah. Penrose. He's kind of skeptical uh, about the brain being the seat of consciousness, you know. Just, I mean, as I said, there's I'm... There's not a lot there. Yeah. I mean, I'm a rationalist. I'm a materialist. Yeah. Um, you know... I, I would imagine that most of consciousness, you know, what you perceive as your consciousness comes from your brain, but I am perfectly willing to accept that there might be something out there. There might be some kind of link with some kind of outside. Like I said, even, you know, going back to young, it could be like some kind of weird collective unconscious thing, but there might be some underlying structure to that. There might be some kind of underlying principle to that that we just don't understand yet. There isn't a way to know right now. So right, that's what I'm saying. There's no sense in even really arguing about it. Yeah, just, that's what uh, I'm saying. I kind of like believe that consciousness is very different than mind. Okay. Yeah. Who you are, your memories, all that stuff is probably in your brain. Okay. Uh, but that's, that doesn't necessarily give you this sensation of being that sensation of being or this is the sensation of, of of presence that you have like i feel like i'm here i don't believe it's inside the brain i think it's i think it's like what roger Pembrose rose says it's a some kind of quantum process going on you know yeah, that's perfectly that's possible. That's what the soul would be. That's perfectly possible. Yeah. And, and it may not really be uh it may not really be uh dependent on the on the the physical presence of a brain. Yeah, which I'm kind of fucked up and I'm having a hard time explaining <laughs> that. But, but uh when you die, I don't think you lose your point of view, but based upon my near death experience, you lose a real close connection with the sensation of being who you were. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, when I had a near-death experience, I didn't feel real connected to Tom Ross. I, rem I remembered him. But it was like it was somebody else. Like a role that I had been playing. Hmm, interesting. You know what I mean? I, like a character I had played. But that's not me. Who I was was a lot simpler. And it was more in the here and now. It wasn't dependent on memory. I felt very squirrel-like. Like a little creature. Yeah. That could exist. That could see. You know what I mean? It was like... I felt more like a point of view than a person. Than a person. Yeah. Which, you know, maybe that's what it is. Maybe there's just some kind of rudimentary... Yeah, it was real rudimentary. Um you know, a fragment of you that's yeah. kind of out there, like I said, in Jungian terms and the collective unconscious, but all your memories, your actual, um, you know, experience of yourself as an individual, maybe yeah. that all does reside in your brain, but there is some little bit of you. That... I felt like I had possessed Tom Ross, you know what I'm talking about, and experienced his life, but that wasn't me. What I was was a lot simpler. And it was just like a point of view. And it was free out, outside of the time-space continuum. And it could go into anything or anyone. And it was kind of like watching a movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it more felt like to me. And it I was all that. fun. It, yeah. It was not a serious business. Which I, I would hope that that's a, a liberating message to you people. That it wasn't serious, really. 
It was all fun and games. Well, I kind of try, like I said, as much of a materialist or whatever as I am, it just does kind of, honestly, all I want is that when I'm dying, it's like, as long as I think to myself, hey, it's going to be okay, like before I die, then I'm good. Yeah, that's what it's like. It's actually that simple. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'm good. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. It doesn't matter to me if I'm like, come back yeah. later or something. That doesn't matter to me. Um, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah, so, as I said, so, so the first thing we're, so he's already getting a little bit into, as I said, spiritualism and talking about mediums and that kind of stuff. Now, 1903, another significant thing that happens is that he gets married. Now, the woman that he married was named Emma Rauschenbach. Now, this was, uh, interesting for many reasons, because Emma came from a very, very wealthy family. Uh, her family had been involved. They had a lot of businesses, but probably their most significant one sold like luxury watches. So they had like fucking Boku money. So I, hold on what, one second. Fucking Michael Schaefer fucking he had he brought up a good thing. It's like the Vulcan Katra. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the Katra. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Victor said, all I want when I die is for the rest of the world to die with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's all right. They don't want, they don't want to go. It's all right. Yeah. I'm, I'm all right with it. I'm, I've, I've, achieved yeah, they're, they're, a, they're, I've achieved a state of zen about it. Mark was asking me about it. Like, and they're talking about this other squirrel. Like, yeah. Quantum squirrel somebody. Yeah, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like being a squirrel. It's your katra. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Though. You know, but yeah, so this woman he married, um, apparently here's the weird thing. Apparently what happened was that he had seen her somewhere or so he claimed later because he's a big, um, Carl Jung was a big advocate of, uh, synchronicity. Um, yeah. it was one of the big things that he came up with. It's like, you know, shit that in, and like predestination, not necessarily predestination, but like, you know, th there were no such thing as coincidences. He was kind of into that. So apparently he saw this girl first when she was 14, maybe. I don't think they didn't get married till later. It's fine. But um, he saw her and he was like, yeah, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And he was in his 20s at the time. And he did end up marrying her later on. Now, this, as I said, this was significant because her family was super, super wealthy, which meant because uh, of his broke ass that he didn't have to worry about not having money anymore because now he was like funded because he was chiching. Yeah. He was married to this like really, really wealthy yeah. family and married into this wealthy family. Um, but it also turned out that his wife, Emma was also pretty kick ass, like in her own right. She wasn't like super educated as a lot of women at the time were not. However, when she started getting into his theories and reading his stuff, she got really, really into it. And actually, she ended up being, I believe, his, uh, you know, his assistant when he went to work at a mental hospital later. And, um, you know, so she was very much instrumental in helping him, you know, develop his theories and write about his stuff and everything. So, you know, now one thing I will note is that I've seen this put a couple of different ways. In modern parlance, we could probably say that their marriage was an open marriage. I'm not really sure if she was super on board with this, but it's not like women had a lot of say in the matter back then. Um, Carl Jung, not going to lie, was by all accounts, a bit of a poon hound. Um, he was kind of like, he'd see a hot lady and he'd be like, yep, I'm going to get that. And he wasn't real ethical about whether they were, they had come to him for analysis or whatever. Um, he actually did get into some relationships with women that he was, um, you know, analyzing and whatnot. Because, like I said, it's a, you know, psychiatry was kind of a new field back then, so maybe ethics wasn't a consideration. But he was uh, banging some chicks, allegedly, uh, you know, on the thing. Now, apparently she did, his wife did know about it. I don't think she was entirely happy about it, but... I guess they kind of later came to some understanding because they did actually remain married until she died. And she didn't die until 1955. 
Um, but like I said, I don't think she was super jazzed about it. I don't know if she got any of her own on the side. I hope she did. But, uh, cause apparently he had a whole bunch on the side. So hopefully she took up her end of that bargain. But, um, but I'm not real sure. But like I said, he was, uh, you have to think if you've seen pictures of him, he was, uh, not, you know, not a lo- a bad looking dude for the time. Uh, he was real tall. He was apparently super, super charismatic, really magnetic. Um, and, uh, ladies loved him. So he was really not shy about taking women up on that shit, whether he was married or not. And, um, you know, so there was that whole thing. But like I said, he did remain married to his wife until her death in 1955. And she was actually instrumental in helping him a great deal in his work. And I guess she either just put up with it or was having her own fun on the side. I don't really know. Nobody knows. But that's, um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now, so 1905... Um, Carl Jung gets appointed to the permanent, uh, senior doctor at the hospital and, you know, also became a lecturer, lecturer at Zurich University. Now, so let's talk a little bit about this relationship between Jung and Freud, because I feel like this was a massive influence, not only on both parties involved, but also kind of on the history of psychology, psychiatry in general. So what ends up happening, there was about a 20 year age gap between the two men. So as I said, Freud was already fairly famous by the time Jung came on the scene. Um, Now, what ends up happening is that one of the, um, a friend of Jung's knew Freud. And when Jung published his first book, He actually tried to send a copy to Freud, but Freud had already purchased it because here's the thing. I feel like Freud, as I mentioned earlier, he kind of, you know, he came up with the whole thing about psychoanalysis and his whole thing was kind of like every neurosis can, and you know, this might be a simplification. This is a simplification, but he was kind of like, well, every neurosis can be tied back to some sexual thing, like in someone's childhood, right? In their upbringing, Oedipal complex, all that kind of stuff. So I kind of feel like he thought everything could be tied back to that. And even from a very, very early stage, a lot of his colleagues were already kind of starting to be like, man, don't you think that's a little narrow? Or don't you think that, you know not everything can be tied back to that. You're too fixated on it. So he so. was getting blowback even back then. You know it, what I'm saying? It's a Victorian thing. It is. To blame everything on fucking sex. Sure. And fucking toilet training. That's really what he was all about. Sex and toilet training. And I don't really think that's fucking... Yeah, everything was like genitally focused. Yeah. And I feel like that might be more... You know, I I don't want to cast aspersions on the dude, but it does seem like maybe that's more... He's projecting. Of Yeah, that might be more of like a projection of something yeah. that he was going through. But, you know... Most lo- people aren't that fixated on the shit. Well, it, well, the thing about it is that anytime you're trying to tie something as complex as human behavior back to one single factor, I feel like you're doomed to failure. Yeah. Because humans are very complicated creatures and you know whatever you have going on in your life whatever negative shit that you have going on i don't think that there's ever it's there it's never just like a one-to-one thing never it's always an interaction of shit you have going on in your brain shit you have going on in your family shit you have the shit that's going on like in the wider world there's just all kind of so many different things like interacting To a point where you can't really separate what the exact cause is. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like anytime you're trying to be like, oh, well, you know, you have this particular neurosis because your mom didn't breastfeed you enough. I mean, anytime you're trying to like, that's very reductive. Right. And I feel like even at the time, other people were getting on Freud's case about that. And even young, 
as much as he admired Freud, um, I think even he got to a point where the, well, this is too limiting and he had to come in, which I think led to the rift between the two of them, which did happen later on. Like they worked together for about six years. When you think about it though, because I can remember my reaction to this shit when I first heard about it. Well, you are having this problem because back when you were a baby, your mama said this and this. It almost kind (laughs) of like sounded like maybe it'd be plausible because it was so meticulous. Well, you know what I'm talking about? Easy. It's it's very easy way. You're like, yeah, yeah, maybe that may, yeah, maybe so. But that's not the way life is. You know what I mean? It's just that's just not how life is. Well, yeah. He's he's he was he's overdoing it. Well, like I said, you and know? I can see why life people... is too long. Yeah, there's too much time involved in it. You know what I mean? To trace your problem back to a single to one thing thing. You know what I mean? That took two seconds. That's not the way life is. That's what I mean, and yeah. I feel I feel like we've hit on this a little bit when we talk about serial killers and we talk about their upbringing and blah yeah. blah blah. And we talk about nature, nurture, all that kind of stuff. I just feel like the reason that no one has come to um, kind of a specific fucking answer to all this is because there isn't one. It's no. just it's too complex to be prized apart. Humans you are not digital. That's what I mean. You, it's, uh, it's not a thing where it's like, you know, hey, like your mom fucked up your toilet training or she looked at your genitals funny or something like that one time and subsequently you're like you became now. a kleptomaniac yeah. or whatever. I'm it doesn't just like, work that way. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone's life is just a, this huge panoply of yeah. a million different uh, influences a million different. It's a, and like I said, it's right. it's shit you think. It's shit That's, the outside world. It's your cultural yeah. context. It's your family. Yeah. It's everything. Yeah, your mom looked at your junk. And that's why you're fucked up, okay? <laughs> that's a that's like a fucking really good fucking pat answer to your problems, all right? But when you really look at it, that's the same kind of shit L. Ron Hubbard was telling people. That's it what was. I mean. Like, I understand... So it's life is not that fucking simple. And the, okay. that's the thing. And I understand humans are very... Yeah. They really want <laughs> there to be an easy answer to everything. That's not how it it's is. It's like, look, I can take this yeah. pill and I'll lose weight. Or I'll yeah. buy this particular piece of exercise equipment and I'll lose weight. So you know what I mean? Yeah. B- people want easy solutions to their problems. But I hate to tell you, there isn't. Yeah. There just isn't that. But it's very attractive to people to want that, though. Yeah. The truth is, is that you're fucked up because it was a long time of things fucking you up and you reacted in a fucked up way. <laughs> so you are fucked up. That's that's the truth of it. That's but, the truth of the matter. But and you got to unfuck yourself. The silver lining so, in that is yeah. that everyone is fucked up <laughs> to a certain extent. We're all fucked up. You better it's unfuck okay. yourself. <laughs> No, that's what I'm saying. It's a, you know, it, yeah. I know it may, it might not be that comforting for people, right. but it's like, look, everyone's fucked up to a certain degree. Everybody. We're all humans. No one's yeah. perfect. Everyone's got bad shit going on. Everybody. Just have fun. Just, yeah, yeah. just, worry you can't it. worry about it too don't much. You can't, shit. you know. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Indeed. I know it sucks. Everything sucks. Just don't worry about it. It's, you know. It'll be all right. Listen It'll to be all right, and you don't live that long, even if it isn't going to be all right. You don't live that long anyway. Well, It'll that's good. You know what? You know, you know what's weird? It's It'll like this is this is <laughs> this is something that I know this is like strange, and maybe this is just me. Yeah. But in sometimes, like if I get real upset about something, yeah. this actually makes me feel better. I always, <laughs> I always feel like if some if I if something went wrong and I feel really bad about it. I always think to myself, okay, in the grand scheme of the universe, as in going back to like the fucking time when the asteroid hit the earth and like wiped out all the dinosaurs and shit like that. In 50 years, will anyone give a shit about this? Will anyone remember me? Will anyone? And you know what? It's like, that's, it's kind of comforting Yeah. because you kind of think, it seems like a big deal right now. It's like, oh my God, it's the yeah. end of the world, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, if you put things in context, if you put things in perspective like that, 
It's like, look, no one's going to care. No one's going to remember. No. Actually, even a year from now, no yeah. one will remember. And it's fine. It blows it's my fine. It blows my fucking mind. I'm You're 50, fine. I'm 51 years old. I feel young as shit. 20 years goes by like nothing. It goes by quickly. All right? 20 years will be 71 years old. When I was growing up, that was an old fucking man. That was a real old man. I, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And I know that you, a lot of you are the same age as me out there. Well, I think that of like it's everybody like, goes through that what? because nobody can believe. Yeah, that it everybody went by that has. Fast. Yeah, well, and everybody has this weird conception yeah. of themselves. Yeah. As they're going to be the exception to the rule. No, no, no. I feel like not. everybody feels like that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. feels like that, right? You weren't made to live that long, and maybe that's a good thing. It's like, what? I'm getting old and yeah, decrepit? Yeah. What the? This wasn't supposed to happen to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It happens to everybody, though. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like everybody goes through that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you can, like, remove yourself... This is my Spock shit talking again. Yeah. You need to remove yourself from that mindset and look at that mindset from outside of yourself. Now, I will tell you this. This is true. Because of technology and just the way that the fucking world is going, 51 is not what 51 was back in 1920. Well, yeah, it's not the same. It's not the fucking same. I mean, I will say that. There are. I did hear some people saying that the people that are alive today could live to be about 120 years old and that, that they that they'll live fucking basically a quality of life of what they would have you know what I mean when they were fucking of a 60 year old today I mean maybe that's true I don't I don't fucking know we'll there's see. no way we'll see when we get there um, you're not really there. There is nothing in fucking science that says that that you have to age. It's just something that happens. It's more like an error. It's an error in your replication of your DNA. So as technology fucking gets better, you might. Well, we're definitely living longer. Everything that is medical is a is a life extension. And process. people of our age, I feel like, look a yeah. lot younger now than they yeah. did 20 yeah. or 30 years ago. The stress on people a long time ago, or the, it's, let's say the stress on, say, my dad was a lot more. A lot more than it is on me, I think. I mean, he aged at a lot faster rate. And then I look at my grandparents, and uh, they lived until their 70s or 80s, but they were fucked up even in their 40s. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like it. That's why. Like it that's why I don't then. really get like people pissing and moaning about oh yeah. this is the end of the world nowadays. It's like oh my god, do you know how much like it fucking easier yeah. it is nowadays than it was back then? Holy crap! Yeah. I'm very yeah. aware of how much easier it is nowadays than yeah, it was it's a lot back easier. then. So I'm just like not gonna worry about it. We just have to wait just, see what happens. I'm taking advantage. Uh, but a lot of little things that are cheap today were super expensive back then. So and it has an impact. Like, for instance, I have a machine that takes my blood pressure, okay? It'll tell me what my blood pressure is. Yeah. Nothing didn't cost anything. But in the time of my grandfather, that machine would have been thousands of dollars. Which is funny because now you can walk into any CVS and, yeah. do the, and get your blood right. pressure for free. Right. In the little Or Publix right. has one, too. And you can also get little machines that will test your blood pressure or oh. your blood sugar level. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And that was that was unheard of in my grandfather's time. So look at all the shit you can do with fucking apps on your cell phone now. Yeah, you guys. yeah. Come on. So it is changing. Everything is so easy. Yeah. And I don't think that's bad. I think I don't no. think we should complain about that. Oh, everything's too easy now. Good, good. I don't think shit should be hard. Especially shit like that. I mean, come on. If we can make shit easier yeah. for people like that, then we should. Yeah. Absolutely. But people also have to understand that in order to fucking really reap the benefits of this kind of shit, diet and exercise, you can't just sit around eating unlimited amounts of food. Well, I've never been able to do It will fucking that. kill you. You know? But, um... And that advice that I'm giving you about fucking diet and exercise that goes all the way back to the fucking Greek age. You realize that? You had fucking 
um, Archimedes was saying shit like that. That was fucking what? 2,000 years ago? Well, at least. <laughs> 2,000 yeah. Archimedes yeah. was saying, exercise, eat well, and you'll live a long time. <laughs> you know? But, uh, just goes to show they weren't so dumb back then. Yeah, they were dumb. Well, right. and some of the sh- some shit is just, You're right. you know, our biology is the same as people back then. Yeah. So they figured that out. You eat too much, you'll get fat, and you'll die earlier. Yeah. So you know, that's how shit goes. So all right, so can we? Although get let's back be in honest, what? it's only the difference between a decade or so. I mean, it's not like you can save yourself a fucking thousand years of lifespan. Well, yeah, I mean, I you're mean, still but... going to die, but the thing about it is that... <laughs> you might get an extra ten years. <laughs> and you have to think, too, that what it's not just, like, the length of time, it's, like, the quality. The quality of it, right. I mean, you don't want to live, like, 20 years on a fucking ventilator, obviously. Right. Or, you know, or not being able to walk, or just, like, laying in bed like one of those, like, fucking thousand-pound motherfuckers. Yeah, there, there is, like, a lot of new shit that's been happening, of course, you know, a fucking... Uh, what's being learned in uh, fitness and like you guys know that I'm not 100% fucking natural I have fucked around with SARMs and stuff but if you look at what was happening in the 70s the guys like Arnold and shit you find out that things like anabolic steroids can fucking kill you early. Yeah, you look great when you're young, but by the time you're fucking 70 or 80, you're fucking shot. Don't fuck with that stuff, you know? Um, but then you can you can flip that around backwards and say, well, you had guys like um, uh, fucking Jack Lane who didn't mess with it, didn't mess with anabolic steroids until they were already old, and they lived until their 90s. So there are some things that you can do with these drugs that are out there, you know. Just saying. And as I just said, just don't abuse to, shit when you're young. Right, right, right. And to right. an extent, it's like I would never advocate depending too much on any one thing. Yeah. But it's just kind of like anything, whether we're talking about technology or whether we're talking about you know biological or you know any kind of like you know enhancement drugs or anything like that. Yeah. I just kind of feel like if that is going to be of benefit to you if you're not abusing it, then by all means, you should take advantage yeah. if you think that it's going to have an advantage for you personally. Yeah. If you don't want to do it, then don't. Yeah. From it's what okay. I've been seeing, uh, you know, as a guy at 51 years old, my age, live a fit and healthy life for as long as you can. When you start getting into your fucking 50s, if you have to mess with those anabolics and all kinds of weird fucking drugs, if you, I think that that will extend your life. There's fucking, uh, there's some evidence of that. Some guys have lived a long time, but you don't want to take that early. It's, it's yeah, I can the end. Yeah, I kind of feel like, end. like you said, I I feel like people that took steroids and shit like that when they were younger, it fucked them up. Yeah. I feel like if you're gonna do that, wait till you're already old, and when then you have it. less to risk, yeah, and because <laughs> you, you'll see more, well, like you'll the, you'll see more advantage from yeah, it. Yeah, seem like they had like bumped themselves up to be at a certain fucking hormonal level for longer. Yeah, they died in their nineties, but what's wrong with that? I mean, that's, Dying lo- in your that's 90s longer is fucking, than a lot of people right. live. And a guy like fucking Jack, Jack was fucking in great shape. In his late eighties, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he looked good. He was strong his whole life. So, you're gonna die anyway. I mean, at this yeah. point, I'm kind of like ambivalent about. You're die anyway. Yeah, I'm ambivalent about what age I die at. Yeah. I just I don't really want to. I just I don't really want to suffer. I don't want to be to a point where it's just like I just feel like crap all the time. Yeah. And I just feel like i'm going on for the sake of going on i just i think that's pointless but if i was able to somehow without having to like fucking kill myself you know ironically um you know to live longer if i'm still feeling good then shit i'll just like keep on trucking yeah. everybody's talking about what we're talking about right right you know yeah well i'm just saying we're talking about like some you know fucking shit here 
So, so all right. Like, Jenny, what? you shooting Tom up with roids? No, I'm not on no, steroids. He's not on steroids. Yeah. It's, they're kind of like, they're not steroids. They're. Right. I did take some SARMs. Yeah. Okay, which are, but... which are what? Explain that to people. SARMs are um, selective androgen receptor modulators. They have a steroidal effect, but they're not they're not steroids. Here, cause they explain that. I'm gonna think, go to the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> they make your system think that maybe you took something that was steroidal, but it, it's not. It's just it's just activating the fucking receptor. Um, they're they're not illegal. They are illegal. But they're um, uh, they're not for human consumption. That's what they say. It's a it's a research chemical. Um, now, some people would say, "Well, would you take steroids?" Yeah, fucking right. Um, I would, but it's not really time. In in my um, in the way I'm thinking about it, you should take steroids in your final decades. You know what I mean? Um, steroidal compounds allow you to fucking build muscle uh, and what they are is they're kind of like a uh, they're a they're, they're very much kind of like uh, like a fake testosterone as you get older your fucking normal uh your normal fucking testosterone production starts to kind of wane. So, taking some kind of a fucking hormone can can help keep you in good health. That's a good way to put it. I wouldn't probably take steroids off the bat. I would probably do more like what's called HRT, which is fucking... Hormone kind of like a hormone therapy. replacement therapy. That would probably be the first, th the first thing I would do. A lot of guys that are taking steroids are trying to get bigger than they can possibly get um, in order to fucking win these fucking bodybuilding competitions. You don't really need that. All right? I'm kind of fucking loaded. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really need that. But what could help you actually live longer would be hormone replacement therapy. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. There are some women out there taking fucking testosterone, slight amounts of it, and fucking they look great. You just have to fucking know what it is you're doing. You got to research and see what other people are doing. And, um, you know... If I was an older woman, maybe I might want to consider some of these fucking hormone replacement therapies. Was yeah. that a hint or something? Oh, no. Not time for <laughs> but, you know what I mean? You can, you can actually do fucking real well. Now, it doesn't just... Now, it's not just something that you fucking inject and, and, you're, and you're ready. You know? You have to fucking exercise, too. You know? It's not something that's just... It's not, some, it's not a fix in a bottle. It, it, it's going to yeah, require I... lifestyle changes. Diet and exercise, you know. But that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, yeah. where humans very much want there to be an easy solution. For there things, is never an easy solution. But there's not. There, there's never. I and you don't you. want an easy solution. I like hard solutions. Like Jenny knows. I fucking work out fucking several times a week, fucking and fucking lifting weights and shit. It's the challenge of it. You yeah, know? you can't just... I mean, as much as I would like... Uh, you know, there to be a pill that fixes everything. It's not how that's, it goes. That's not how things go. Things are too complicated for that. Yeah, and that's not so. how that's not how metabolism and that's not how metabolism works. That's not how biology works. You know what I mean? Your biological system is like a fire. You have to add fuel to it, and you have to keep the flames going. And it's a it, it's a metabolism is about growth. Okay. Growth. Growth. All right. And death is the antithesis of growth. You're not growing. You're shrinking. That's what death is. Into is. a mummy. Yeah, right. And, you know, you're you're only going to be able to grow up to a certain point, but you can fight it. You can fight it. 
Yeah, I mean, you can't just, like, let fucking life stomp all over you, but there's only so much you can do. I mean, obviously, death is going to come get you in the end, but you can make it hard for death. You know. When when I was working in fucking Wellesley, Massachusetts, as a salesman, I once went into a house where I met a woman who was in her 80s, and she was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. She looked great when I saw her. Her, just her face, the aura around her, her figure. And she was a, an ice skater, an, an Olympic skater when she was young. And she stayed very active. And she showed me pictures of herself when she was in her fucking 20s and everything. And she looked, she looked like fucking um, Barbara Eden, really, is what she looked like. And from that, I saw that old age isn't doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily like a sentence of like a death sentence. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like being fat and ugly. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily. Mean it. <laughs> now you know she. I know she's dead by now. This is a long time ago. But she was just a um, a very active woman who worked out. Fucking, you know, she was still going to the gym. And she was in her 80s, and she looked great. So from that, that was the first time I, I said to her, I said, man, people, we need to take a picture of you, let people know that this is possible. And she was like, well, I just work out, and you know, and I still ice skate. And You control more of your fucking physiology than you, than, than, than you know you do. You know, you, you do. A lot of it has to do with the oh. mind. The mind and the body are closely linked. And if you can fucking bump yourself up with fucking steroidal compounds.